I wanted to bring you the update this morning on the cooperative program that we have with Auburn University as well as the work that we're doing at uh, Dawson at our lab. And this reflects the work of um, Dr. Chen. Trying to figure out how to make this thing work. Okay, I see it. Dr. Charles Chen at Auburn University who couldn't be with us today, but also Fat Dang and Renee Arias um, who are biochemists and molecular biologists at our lab. And so i just bring you the update on this. We have a good breeding program going in Auburn that is reaching a good level of maturity. And we're testing these in Georgia, two sites in Alabama, one being on the station in Headland, one over on the Gulf Coast station, as well as a site in Mississippi. And we've got two lines that are looking really promising. Right now we're just calling them the 14AU29 and also the 34. When you look at the yields of these varieties, this is across, as I mentioned, four locations and across two years. And as you can see, the AU-29 averaged 6,350 pounds roughly, the 34, 6,200 pounds, and not statistically are not different from the Georgia 06G. These uh, yields are very tight. These are two hyolate varieties, uh, both of these are and Dr. John Beasley, which of course we all know, is preparing a committee to put together for variety release of these through the Auburn program. So we're excited about these. There's some more lines coming through the pipeline right now that are equal to these with a little um, different variation on those. Um, but right now we're real excited about getting these increased and getting them out and getting them available to the growers. Now, as far as what it did in Georgia, that would be this area right here. And as you can see, again, comparable to Georgia 06G in the Georgia test. We're also working, looking at uh, what are the best lines that we had in a test down in Headland, looking at leaf spot resistance. And I'll sum this up in a second, so I won't spend much time here, but definitely some good lines that we can have in there to improve leaf spot resistance. And again, as Corley mentioned, talking about some of the marker selection work. But the summary is that we have six effect, uh, effective markers associated with late leaf spot. Um, and we're working to get those into the program so that we can have, you know, and continue on this late leaf spot um, resistance. And some very good lines that we've identified as these sources of this resistance. We're working again on uh, Fat Dang is. Looking at um, some Indel markers, we've got two identified that have excellent resistance to late leaf spot only, and we have two that are identified with excellent resistance to, uh, that are associated with tomato spotted wilt virus and leaf spot resistance. So we're moving those forward in the program as well. Then, of course, a major focus of what we do at the lab is looking for drought markers. Um, we have a very unique facility at our lab in order to do this, to where we can have both rainfall control or water control, but also temperature control. And this is a good facility that we have. Many of you have visited, and we are moving along very rapidly here and identifying some lines that seem to be showing some resistance or uh, improvements in uh, drought resistance. This is a paper that Dr. Arias published looking at the, a draft of the genome sequence for um, early leaf spot in peanuts. Uh, very good work. A very unique journal uh, article. Now, another thing that she is working on is aflatoxin. And we're looking at a new technique, which is basically RNA interference. Uh, very advanced molecular biology that is involved here. And if you look at the results that she's had, and this is strictly laboratory results, okay? So understand that where we're at progress-wise with this. If you look at a couple of these lines, here is the control, and this is aflatoxin <coughs> on a log scale, and across this scale is the number of hours of incubation, okay? The control, which is the untreated, not just a regular line, you can see had up to 6,000 parts per billion in aflatoxin. The RNA I lines that Renee developed 
had around zero to two parts per billion. And what we're doing is interfering with the aflatoxin synthesis, synthesis pathway. And this is very powerful technology. It's used in the medical field, veterinary field, as well as a lot of other applications for this. But as you can see that across these two different lines right here, control was extremely high. And when we had the RNA lines, almost zero, and another one extremely high and almost zero. And of course, this is, as I said, very preliminary work. This is work that we have a long way to go to fully understand what we're dealing with here, but it has tremendous promise of helping us reduce aflatoxin in peanuts. That's a quick run through. Of course, we've got a lot more projects that are ongoing uh, than the data that we showed you here today. And I always like to invite you, if you're interested, to come by our lab. Just let me know and we'll set up a tour. You can learn a lot more about what we have going on.